Dennis Gartman is the editor and publisher of the Gartman Letter. He has quite a background and a tremendous work ethic that you may be able to follow in what he is doing here. He's a graduate of the North Carolina State University. Uh, he was at Cotton Incorporated as an ag economist early on in his career. He's worked his way through to the point that he gets up in the middle of the night and writes this letter that many of you subscribe to and read each day. So if Dennis is wired up and ready to go, let's welcome him, please. Dennis Gardner. I always tell groups before which I speak to be careful about applauding for your speaker before you've heard him. You may regret it by the time he's done. Uh, my name is Dennis Gartman, and I'm a trader. Uh, before I came here, I left my lovely bride of the last uh, 25 years back home. Uh, I lost my first wife to a margin call many years ago. Uh, those, <laughs> those things happen. It's very, very discouraging when you come home from the Board of Trade and say, sweetheart, I lost the house. She said, no, it's right here. And I'd have to say, no, actually, it's not. Uh, wives get very upset about that sort of thing. But uh, my lovely bride of the last 25 years, Margaret, CPA, I left her in uh, Norfolk, Virginia yesterday. And before I did, I said, you know, this is really quite astonishing. Uh, yesterday, I was uh, interviewed by the New York Times. I did a TV show for CNBC. I'm going to be speaking in front of 650 people tomorrow. In your wildest dreams, did you ever think this would happen? And my lovely bride looked at me took my face in her hands and said, we've been married 25 years. It's been 26 since you've been in my wildest dreams. Um, rather harsh, but probably quite true. As I said, I'm a trader. Uh, I make my living trading. Uh, I would go back to undergraduate school at the University of Akron for career day, and I would explain that my name is Dennis Gartman. I'm a trader. And there would invariably be somebody in the audience saying, cool, can you make much money selling America's secrets to other people? And I'd have to tell them, no, it's T-R-A-D-E-R not T-R-A-I-T-O-R, and I've learned over the course of the past 35 years that perhaps being a trader is a far more dangerous proposition than being a trader. I got my graduate degree in economics, tried very hard to overcome that fact. Uh, everything they taught me has proven to be utterly and completely worthless. And when I go back to undergraduate school for career day, after clearing up the fact that it's T-R-A-D-E-R, not T-R-A-I-T-O-R, and people will say, well, what should I study? to become a trader? What would, what would be the best thing? What's the best background? And I would tell them, first of all, my lovely bride of the last 25 years is a CPA. She actually believes that one plus two equals three, unless you're talking to the IRS and you need it to be something else. But no, being a, uh, being a CPA is probably not the best example, best background for being a trader. By this time, you're going to lose about a third of your audience at career day. Somebody will say, well, should I get my degree in economics? And I said, you obviously didn't listen to what I had to tell you. I've learned hard to overcome the fact that I have a graduate degree in economics. It has proven utterly and completely worthless. You now lose another third of your audience. Somebody said, well, should I get a degree in business? And I say, well, an MBA would be nice. Your parents will be very proud of you. But no, quite honestly, on the floor of the Board of Trade where I stood for nine years down in the bond pit trading, and, and there is not a more aptly named place than the pit in Chicago, uh, the fellow who stood to the right of me, uh, Ryan O'Doherty, was, uh, played defensive tackle for my beloved North Carolina State. 285 pounds, 6 feet 7 inches tall. He basically black and blue the right side of my ribs in as he's yelling and screaming. The fellow who stood to the left of me was bigger than was Brian. The fellow who stood behind me, John Ott, was a spitter. So uh, really not a great place to make a living. And I never saw any MBAs down there do very well. So no, your parents will be proud of you if you got your MBA. But no, that's not a good background for being a, a trader. Now you've lost seven-eighths of your audience. Somebody would say, well, finally, what should you study? And I said, if I could do it again, I would go back and study more literature. Not a question. Because investing and trading is the study of the human condition. We are human beings. We make rational and irrational decisions bombarded by all sorts of information. And in graduate school, they taught me that the markets are rational. And I think that is the greatest amount of bunk I have ever heard in my life. Lord Keynes, communist though he was, did make a few interesting statements, the most rational being, the markets will remain irrational far longer than you or I can remain solvent. Gartman's corollary to that is the market will return to rationality the moment you have been rendered insolvent. It's a harsh beast. So no. I, I think that literature is a good background, the study of the human condition. What would, 
Why would Hamlet? How would Hamlet have handled the situation? Would it, Hamlet would have been a terrible traitor. It took him till the fifth act of the play to finally make up his mind that in fact it was his father, or his adopted father or his new stepfather who had killed his original father. If he had found that out earlier, it would be a much shorter play and probably more people would go to watch it. But other than that, understanding why did Hamlet wait so long? He would have been terrible. I wish I had studied more psychology. That really is the study of the human condition because that's what the markets are all about. It's the psychology that exists at any one period of time. Is everybody bullish? You should be bearish. Is everybody bearish? You should be bullish. What's the psychology? I wish I'd studied more psychology. But at any one time, down on the floor, down in the pits, Brian O'Doherty, 285, seven, six feet seven, beating my left side and right side in, down in the pits, which was always, people ask, what was it like in the pit at the time? And I said, it's rather like being a, an air traffic controller. It was hours of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror, which is really what it was like. So what would be the best background? I said, you know what? Religion. Because at any one time, there were 15 people down there saying, oh, good God, just let this thing come back, and I promise I'll never do that again. <laughs> the problem is that we are all sinners in the hands of an angry God with a much larger margin account than is yours or mine. And, Sadly, that is the circumstance. I'm supposed to talk about the economy, and I'm supposed to talk about real estate. That's my job here today. I'm lucky enough to get up every morning. I get up literally at 1 o'clock in the morning Eastern time to prepare, and, and I'm proud of the fact that I've been doing it now for 26 years, and I have not missed a single day except for my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. I took that day off. I thought that was reasonable to do. But I get up every morning and try to write seven or eight or nine pages of, of cogent and, and hopefully sometimes humorous commentary on what's going on geopolitically. What's happening in Zimbabwe? What's happening in China? What's going on at the Central Bank of Europe? What are we doing here in the United States? What's going on in Syria? Who's the leading factions in the war in Syria? That's my job and it's, it's a wonderful ability, a wonderful uh, scam as one of my friends said that I have been able to create over the course of the last almost three decades. I get up every day because I understood when I came out of the trading arena myself, having been on a, on a trading desk at what was then uh, North Carolina National Bank down in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I traded foreign exchange back in the early 70s, I found it amusing that the foreign exchange traders did not talk to the bond traders. The bond traders did not talk to the equity traders. The equity traders did not talk to the bank lenders. You can go to Goldman Sachs's operation in New York even still, and the energy traders do not talk to the foreign exchange traders, who do not talk to the grain traders. And I thought it would be my job to become the liberal arts major of the capital markets. I know a little bit about wheat. I know a little bit about cotton. I know a little bit about the energy markets. I know a little bit about how the bond market functions. I know a little bit about central banking capabilities. And my job was to be the liberal arts major to, to ostensibly stand 35,000 feet above what's going on, far from the matting crowd. I'm, I'm down, I live in Suffolk, Virginia, not far from Norfolk, and that's how we pronounce it. That's the proper way. We don't smoke, we don't drink. Norfolk, Norfolk. Um, that's the cheer. Okay. That'll help you remember how to pronounce it next time you're somewhere flying in our region. It's actually the major cheer of Granby High School. It's, I've always found that amusing. Um, my job was to be that, that person looking out over the market and say, this I find interesting, this I find interesting, and this I find interesting. So let's talk about what are the things that I find interesting, and we'll, we'll, we'll tie it all together by what's going on in the real estate market. What do I find interesting? I find it interesting that we are in a new regime of a much stronger dollar. And it is astonishing how Far the distance has come if you listen to the media nowadays, but from somebody who's been trading foreign exchange, and foreign exchange is absolutely central to economic circumstances. It drives everything else. Foreign exchange and demographics. If you learn those two things, you'll be surprised at how, how many answers you'll get as to what's going on around the world. The dollar, if you listen to the media, if you listen to CNBC, if you listen to Bloomberg Television, if you read the Wall Street Journal, if you read the Financial Times, they will tell you this has been an extraordinary move as far as the dollar is concerned. It is not an extraordinary move as far as the dollar is concerned. The rest of the world is simply in chaos. Who in their right mind would put money right now into Europe 
given the circumstances that prevail economically where almost every single country in Europe is, whether they like it or not, in recession, where the demographics are so horrifyingly bad that the countries cannot replicate themselves. Germany's, Germans do not replicate themselves. Germany's population is already beginning to tip over. Ireland's is tipping over. Italy's, strangely enough, is tipping over. England's is tipping over. France, were it not for the importation of Arabs, would be tipping over. Luxembourg is tipping over. Every single country in Europe, the demographics have turned from the upper left to the lower right, and the Europeans are not replicating themselves. It is difficult in an environment such as that to have economic growth. You need population growth above all, and none of the countries in Europe have it. Two, all of the countries in Europe are amazingly left-wing in orientation. They are collectivist in their policies. They believe in central planning, and central planning simply doesn't work. Why would capital under any circumstance in that environment, all things being otherwise equal, find its way to Europe? It won't, it isn't, it can't, and in the future it shall not be. We have now seen the euro go from, from 1.4 euros to the US dollar down to 111 at one time this morning. It's on its way at least to parity. It may go far beyond there. Unless Europe, and thankfully the ECB did something right yesterday by following what we did here in the United States, and I'll get to Fed policy in just a few minutes, finally the ECB acted properly and said, we agree, we're in, we'll play the game, we're going to expand reserves into the banking system. The Germans have been reticent to do so, and the Germans have finally lost. And with a name like Gartmann, you would think I would be a supporter of the Germans, but the Germans were wrong. They have been wrong. They are wrong now. And finally, they're getting to do the right thing. It is far too late. The euro is heading at least to parity, if not farther down. Every country in Europe, with the possible exception, the possible exception of Finland, is in recession, and they won't admit it, but the data is abundantly clear, and that's what's happening. Japan. Japan is so much worse off than we are, it is stunning. If you think the demographics in Europe are ill, the demographics in Japan are even worse. The United Nations says it takes 2.1 children for every woman to keep the population of the world growing forward. It's a good number, 2.1. That's the birth rate that you must have. In Japan right now, it is 1.4. The women have literally dropped out of the marriage pool. They have stopped getting married. If I were a Japanese woman, I'd drop out of the marriage pool. I understand the deal. But they have quit having children. Worse, they're getting older when they get married. The average uh, Japanese woman nowadays, instead of being married at 21, is if she is getting married, is getting married at nearly 29. And that is getting very close to the end of having a, a childbirthing era. It is astonishing what is taking place over there. The Japanese government itself has said that in 35 years, the population of Japan, nothing else changing, will fall by half. Can you imagine a country whose population shall fall by half? Worse for the Japanese, they are the most racist country the world has ever seen. They will never allow immigration. They have never allowed immigration. They do not allow immigration now, nor shall they ever allow immigration in the future. We don't do a very good job here in the United States of repopulating ourselves, nor do the Canadians, nor do the Australians, nor do the New Zealanders, but at least all four of those countries are having population increases because we do allow immigration. Japan does not. And unless it does, unless it changes, and it won't, Japan is doomed. <clears throat> Japan is the most indebted nation the world has ever seen. We hear all the time that we are in debt here in the United States. Our total debt to GDP is about $1.4 uh, dollars per GDP. In Japan right now, it is 2.1. And it is moving from the lower left to the upper right. It is getting worse and worse every single day, every single week, every single month, every single year. It will be much worse next year. Japan is the most indebted nation the world has ever seen as far as industrialized nations are concerned, and its currency is doomed. When I first started trading foreign exchange in the early 1970s, I can remember trading dollar yen at 365 yen to the dollar. We watched it go from 365 yen 
it traded to what I called the obscene number. It traded to 49.95 yen to the dollar. That was back in the days when everybody was concerned that Japan was going to be transcendent, that it was going to buy Rockefeller Center. I thought it was so amusing when everybody was concerned that the Japanese were going to buy Rockefeller Center. I said, sell it. Sell it to them at a wonderfully exorbitant price. But it was as if people worried they're going to move Rockefeller Center. I didn't think so. My bet was that that would probably still be Rockefeller Center, right where Rockefeller Center is still now. The Japanese paid an extraordinary price. It fell by 70% from the value that they paid for it when they sold it back. It was a brilliant trade on America's part. It was a stupid trade on Japan's part. And if the Japanese are good about anything, they're good at making the stupidest trading decisions at the worst possible time in history every single time. I love them. <laughs> I love them. So dollar yen right now is trading at about 100 and uh, this afternoon or this morning it was trading at about one, 118 yen to the dollar. I can imagine without any equivocation, without any, cap without any problem, Japan has to trade at least back to 200 yen to the dollar over the course of the next several years or it truly will be doomed at simply a faster pace in time. Japan has no choice. It doesn't have enough workers. It can't support itself. The only thing that Japan will be, it will be headquarters for its corporations. Right now, if you buy a Toyota here in the United States, I'm willing to guarantee you one thing, it was made here, not there. We are soon going to be running trade surpluses in the United States because of that fact. It's an astonishing fact, but it's true. Which brings me to the United States, which actually brings me to the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, because we should probably accumulate agglomerate those, those four countries together. Here in the States, people take Dr. Bernanke to task for what he did in 2008. My friends, the gold bugs, and I'm a believer in gold, I'm a buyer of gold, I'm not a gold bug, but the gold bugs, the conspiratorialists, the people who have been worrying about inflation for the past five, six, seven years, because of what Bernanke did when he expanded reserves in the system. And I must tell you, in 2008, for the first time in my life, I was truly frightened. I was economically scared. I thought for several days the whole thing was going to implode. And finally, Bernanke understood that his job, having written his doctoral dissertation on the Depression, and thank goodness that is what he wrote his doctoral dissertation upon, said, my job all other things being equal, no matter what else happens, my job is to be the adult in the room and stand up and say, this stops. And he went with what, is now, what we now euphemistically refer to as quantitative easing. Simply put, he force-fed reserves into the system as aggressively and as violently as he possibly could, and he did absolutely the right thing. The far right wing, and I'm somewhat to the right of Genghis Khan under most circumstances, but the very far right wing took him to task saying that this was going to create an inflation. How wrong were they? How utterly and completely wrong have they been? We haven't had an inflation in the United States. We haven't had an inflation in the West for 20 years. It takes two things to create an inflation. It takes a far too aggressive monetary system, a far too aggressive central bank, the Zimbabwe Central Bank, classic example of doing absolutely the wrong thing, created a massive, wonderful inflation, trillion percent, unbelievable. You, need, you should all go, as, as, as uh, Kuss was talking about, you, need, you could go on to the internet and get a copy They'll send it to you. It's now almost a, a collector's, in fact, it is a collector's item. You can get a copy of a hundred trillion Zimbabwe dollar. At one time, the Zimbabwe dollar traded parity to the U.S. dollar. By the time it was over, it took a hundred trillion of them. That was an inflation. Our central bank has been expanding reserves, but there's a second thing that has to happen in order to create an inflation. You have to have wages inflating. And the problem lies in the fact that wages have not and are not going to inflate in the West anytime soon. In a modern world, with better computer capabilities, with better communications, with faster transportation, the fact of the matter is 
the automobile worker in Detroit, Michigan, if there are any automobile workers left in Detroit, Michigan, who used to think that the automobile worker on the other side of the Windsor, in, in Canada, in Windsor, thought he was his opponent, worried about that worker competing with him, now both understand that they're competing with workers in China, workers in India, workers in Malaysia, workers in Indonesia, and soon workers in, 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 in Africa. Billions of people around the world are being brought into the modern world. They are, being they are going to create labor forces that are astonishing in size, cheap in price. And do you really think, do you really think that the automobile worker in Detroit, Michigan, who used to get paid $75 an hour plus fringe benefits, is ever going to be worth $75 an hour again when the same laborer, who's probably only one-fifth as productive, I'll grant that, but is willing to work for $3 an hour in Africa, $3 an hour in China, $2 an hour in Indonesia, once he is taught how to use the machinery, do you really think there will be anything other than continual downward pressure upon wage rates in the industrialized world? If you think otherwise, you are naive. The world has indeed changed. And downward pressure, the middle class, to think in the United States, to think in Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand, that I do think are the best countries in the world, to think that you're going to have an high, a high school education in any of those countries and have a middle class income, a middle class lifestyle that everybody got used to in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s is done. That's over. That's gone. It's not coming back. I was fortunate enough to grow up in Akron, Ohio. I actually grew up in a little town called Cuyahoga Falls. We were famous in the 1960s. We were the city through which the Cuyahoga River, the, the river that spontaneously burst into flames and, and burned for several years, we used to take our dates to watch the river burn. It was wonderful to see. I grew up in Akron, Ohio. Akron, Ohio was the rubber capital of the world. Don't get a bad thought. It was tires. That's what we made there. Every car in, 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 in the United States, every car in Canada, most of the cars in Europe had tires made in Akron, Ohio. There has not been a tire manufactured in Akron, Ohio, not one, since 1974. Not one. What's interesting about Akron, Ohio, is if you ask the people of Akron, would they like the rubber companies to come back, 40 years later the answer would be a resounding no. Akron has regenerated itself. Instead of having four or five or six rubber companies that had 25 or 30,000 employees, now there are 6,000 little companies doing all sorts of things. Things I don't even understand. Things to do with the internet. Things to do with, with pharmaceuticals. Akron has completely regenerated itself. And that's what we do well here in the United States. We pay for wisdom. We pay for thought. We pay for new products. We pay for, we're the ones, we created the iPhone. China didn't, Japan didn't, we did it. That's the thing that we do well. We are the mecca for high tech. We're the ones that took agriculture and created GMO seeds. We're the ones that took agriculture and put a spy in the sky so that you guys in the field Instead of having to guess at what your crop looks like, you know to the square yard what your crop looks like. You know to the square yard how to apply fertilizer more effectively than you have ever applied fertilizer in the past, which gives less runoff in the fields. You use it more efficiently. It is far, that's why our farmers produce twice what any other farmers in the world produce. That's why the move in crop production every year barring weather conditions, is from the lower left to the upper right, and why every year we produce more per acre this year than we did last year, and we'll produce more five years from now than we produce this year, and we'll produce more ten years from now than we produce right now. We're the ones who do that. No one else does that. And that's the beauty of this country. Which brings me to the economy here in the United States. We're doing okay, thank you very much. We're doing nicely, thank you. Despite Washington, despite the President, despite Congress, we're doing okay. Are we doing great? No. Are we ever going to return to the days of 5 and 6 percent GDP growth on an annualized basis? Likely not. Are we going to get along at 2.5 and, and 3 and 4 percent 
Probably so. I can see that extending for a long period of time. My biggest fear, and again, I am somewhat to the right of Genghis Khan, my biggest fear is that we will attempt to do something to balance the budget. <gasps> what? Attempt to do something to balance the budget? Yes, that is my greatest fear. <coughs> I fear it because we saw in the President's State of the Union address the other night, the only thing the left understands to do is raise taxes. It's the only thing they understand. They think that every time they raise taxes, they believe this in their soul, that if you raise taxes 5%, you'll get 5% more tax revenue. Hogwash. Hogwash. My favorite example of that is New Zealand in the 1980s. New Zealand was an absolute agricultural model in the 60s, 70s, and into the early 1980s. It led the world. It was a wonderful, thank you, I need that. That is gin, is it not? Excellent. Ah, a martini. Uh, no, I'm not pro-ethanol, but I know this is a crowd that is pro-ethanol, so I'll keep quiet about that. Okay. Zimbabwe was a, had, had been a, a, an, a, an, a wonderful nation, and it decided as it moved to the left, because of its wonderfulness, that it raised taxes, and it took the marginal rate on taxes can you believe this, to 75%. And you went to the marginal tax rate at 75% at an income of less than $35,000. Now that's astonishing. But they believed that if they raised the taxes, because they were beginning to run budget deficits, that if we just raise the taxes enough, we'll get more tax revenue. The IMF came in. The IMF, you don't want those people around because they told New Zealand every single year when their budget deficit got worse as their tax rate went from 50 to 75 percent at the margin, the IMF would come in every year and say, next year raise it just a little bit more. Raise it just a little bit more. Raise it just a little bit more. And next year you'll balance the budget. And every year the budget got worse. Until Sir Roger Douglas, Google Sir Roger Douglas, Sir Roger Douglas became the treasurer of New Zealand. We would call him the, sec the finance minister. And he said, Einstein once said that the definition of, uh, of uh, lunacy, the definition of, of psychosis, is to do the same thing over and over and over again and think you'll get a different policy. He said the IMF has told us to raise taxes every year we get in less. Let's cut the tax rate from 75% to 50. And you'll never guess what happened. They took in more tax revenue. He cut it to 40. You'll never guess what happened. They took in more tax revenue. He cut it to 30. They took in more tax revenue. He cut it to 25. By this time, five years into his regime, New Zealand is now running a budget surplus. He cut it to 20. He took in more tax revenue. Now New Zealand had paid off all of its outstanding debts because tax revenues were so large that the Reserve Bank of New Zealand actually had to ask Roger Douglas to stop cutting taxes, otherwise there would be no more outstanding debt, and the Reserve Bank thought they needed to have some just to do open market operations. It was astonishing. He stood down when he finally got the tax rate to 17%, and New Zealand was running ungodly budget surpluses. And when he passed the baton to Barbara Richardson, who held a press conference on her first day and was asked, are you going to cut taxes anymore, said something truly amazing. She said, I can't, because I can't spend what I'm taking in now. The communists, the Democrats never seem to get that fact. <laughs> they never seem to understand that fact. And so my great fear, my great fear, for the country is that we will attempt to do something as put forth by our president the other night to raise taxes on the one percent so that we pay our fair share crap we pay more than our fair share we pay everybody's share the top one percent last year pay, spent, paid fifty five percent of all the taxes the top five percent paid eighty nine percent of all the taxes the bottom fifty percent of the united states the bottom fifty percent of the wage earners paid three percent of the taxes. The bottom 25% were net takers. So when somebody tells you that we need to balance the budget and we can do it by raising taxes, remind them of New Zealand, remind them what, of what happened there. 
we will attempt to do exactly the same thing that New Zealand did under the IMF, and we will pay a heavy price for it. In a regime of stronger dollar, getting to what you people are involved in, in a regime of stronger dollars, downward pressure upon commodity prices is going to be long-standing. I'm sorry to tell you that. It's a harsh reality. But we are already the most expensive wheat in the world. We are the most expensive corn in the world. We are the most expensive soybeans in the world. And all things being otherwise equal, a continuously stronger dollar, and that is what we are going to get as a continuously stronger dollar, is going to put, has to put, will put, downward pressure upon grain prices, all other things being equal. This year we're probably going to plant, it'll be interesting, we're going to probably plant about 88 million bushels of soybeans and probably about 88 million bushels of corn. It's been a long time since I've ever seen the, 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 the planted acreage numbers being equalized, but because of where the corn bean ratio is, people are going to rather put soybeans in the ground. At these prices, given this demand, and ethanol, I'm sorry, is probably going to be is probably going to go the way of all flesh under the, the, under the present regime, under the present circumstances of low prices of crude oil, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Ethanol is probably gone, and if that happens, you can see corn prices a lot lower, a whole lot lower, way a lot lower. I trust I'm clear. They can take a buck and a half to two dollars out of corn very quickly without any problem. They can take two and three dollars out of soybeans very quickly without any problem. Last year, past several years, well, last year was the first year that we've seen land prices, farmland prices actually decline. But if you take a look at, if you take a look at the ratio of corn prices and bean prices to land prices, land is extraordinarily expensive. Extraordinarily expensive. If you want to make the implied bet, if you want to cast your lot against a rising dollar, against deflationary forces, if you want to be the buyer of $8,000, $8,500, $8,900 land in Iowa, I wish you well. I think you will fail. I think it will be very ugly. If you can hit somebody else's bid, I would do that immediately. Period. End of discussion. I trust I'm clear. Let's talk about crude oil, because that is one of the great benefits that's going to, that will accrue to farming. What has happened in crude oil? Fracking has happened to crude oil. Don't let anybody tell you that it's the Saudis that have put crude oil prices down. They've helped, no question about it. The fact that the Saudis are fighting to retain their market share, which is really what they're attempting to do above all else, they are tired, as anybody would be, to see small peripheral nations, Angola, for example, nations in West Africa, for example, who have been stealing Chinese or who have been stealing Saudi Arabia's crude oil export market, who look at us and see, my word, our biggest client is soon going to be one of our greatest opponents in the business. The Saudis have made it abundantly clear to everyone else that they are going to defend their market share, come hell or high water, and they're doing that. But at the margin, the tipping point, the changing factor, has been fracking. It's amusing, it's amazing to me what fracking has done in the United States. We have gone from producing a mere five million barrels of crude oil a day five years ago to where we are now producing nine and a half million barrels of crude oil a day, nearly a double. Every one of those going into domestic production, none of it yet going into export trade. North America, if we combine the United States, Canada, and Mexico, is now a net exporter of energy to the rest of the world. But very soon, at the rate of production that we're having that's going on, the United States in another couple years would be a net exporter of crude to the rest of the world. It is an astonishing shift. As I said, I grew up in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, from near Akron. I'm on the endowment committee at my university. Last time I went there, I saw oil wells in Akron, Ohio, the Marcellus Shale Formation. You hear about the Bakken in North Dakota. You hear about uh, uh, the, the um, uh, I just went blank, um, the, the oil formations in Texas. I'll think of their names in just a second. But none of you have probably heard about the Marcellus. But the Marcellus Shale extends from the borders of, west, from the borders of my state in Virginia on the west, up through West Virginia, up through Pennsylvania, up through New York, all the way to the St. Lawrence, 
there's probably enough proven reserves of natural gas and crude oil to fund the United States for 100 years if we just go after it. How stupid are the people of New York to ban fracking? How joyous are the people of Pennsylvania because the people in New York have banned fracking? How happy are the people of, of Eastern Ohio because the people in New York have banned fracking? But we have only begun to touch the Marcellus. And what's interesting is, do we think that God was so segregated with his ability to put frackable oil, is it only to be found here in the United States? Was God so generous to the world that he only gave the United States frackable energy? I have to think there's frackable energy in Africa. I suspect there's probably frackable energy in Russia. I bet there's frackable reserves in China. This morning on CNBC, Prince Al-Walid talked and had a wonderful interview. And he made the, I, I think he made the absolute truthful statement that in his lifetime, and I agree with him completely, we shall never see $100 crude oil again. I'll tell you in my lifetime, we will never see $75 crude oil again, ever. Not ever, not never, not know how. Take a look and follow what's going on in the futures markets. The futures, all of you trade, all of you watch the corn market. Start watching the futures markets in oil because the back months are now $15 out two years from now. The back months are $15 above the spot month. It's called a contango. $15 higher than the current spot month is profitable for frackers. Not only that, you're also starting to see people taking delivery of crude oil. There's now almost 40 million barrels of crude stored on the high seas in ships because you can make money by buying that crude oil, selling the forward futures, and re-delivering it. When you have a contangoed market, crude oil is bidding for storage, as I like to say. That's a market that is overtly bearish in size. You hear people saying about the fact that $45 crude will stop the production of fracking in the United States, and what they fail to understand is two-year forward crude is at $60. And any bank lender will lend money on the production of crude oil hedged at $60 per barrel. So crude and natural gas prices are going to stay low for a very long time. Now that we've learned how to frack, we're teaching everybody else how to do it. The world is going to be redundant in energy. Your benefit, redundant energy, cheap energy, inexpensive energy, gasoline at $1.85 a gallon yesterday in Norfolk, Virginia. Unbelievable. I think we might have a chance to look at that a year from now and think that $1.85 gasoline looked expensive. It means cheap fertilizer. $3 per million British thermal units for natural gas makes very cheap nitrogen supplies. That's going to be a wonderful circumstance for you guys in the business of growing crops. It will help overcome the fact that grain prices, I'm afraid, are not going anywhere. Finally, where's the one investment? You have no choice. My first rule of trading is simply this. Write this down. This is going to be the most important rule anybody has ever given you. Do more of the things that have been working. Do less of the things that have not. <laughs> it's the most important trading rule. Any Guys, if taking flowers to your wife or your girlfriend gets you lucky more often, take her flowers on a more consistent basis. <laughs> Do the things that have been working and do less of the things that have not. What has been working? Stocks. They are moving from the lower left to the upper right. They've been going upward on a consistent basis. The monetary authorities are continuing to push reserves into the system. Their intention is to continue to do that. Don't fight the Fed. Don't fight the ECB. Don't fight the Bank of Japan. Don't fight the Bank of Canada. Don't fight the Bank of England. Don't fight any of those major banks unless you're bigger than they are, and my bet is that not any of you here are. The investment I'd probably stay away from? Land. Land. Which brings me to the final comment regarding land and housing. I think the best thing that ever happened to the United States, and I'll make many enemies with this statement, I think the best thing that happened to the United States in the last 15 years is the collapse in housing that took place between 2005 and 2009. 
I think it was great because people were taught the lesson that your house is not an investment. What a stupid idea to think that your house is an investment. Your house keeps the rain off. Your house lets you live where you have good schools. Your house lets you entertain people. But your house was not, is not, nor ever shall be again an investment. And why is that good? Because it's meant that capital that foolishly, stupidly, illogically made its way into the housing market in, 2000, in 1999, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and got wiped out in 8 and 9. As Mark Twain said, a cat that sits upon a hot stove shall never sit upon a hot stove again, nor upon a cold one either, because they all look hot to him, sat on that hot stove, and they ain't going to sit on that hot stove again for a very long period of time. And instead, capital has found its way into plant and equipment and into discovery and into invention and into the things that really make us good. I think that's the best thing that ever happened to the United States. People were taught a terrible, terrible lesson, but they had to learn that lesson. And they won't forget that lesson, at least for a generation. So I'm finished. I've told you my story. I think that we are in an environment here in North America, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia where the wind is at our back, but it's a mild wind. It's a nice wind. It's a pleasant wind. It's not going to be a dramatic wind. It's not going to take us forward, rushing into higher levels. But compared, compared to every place else, we are so much better off than the rest of the world. Money will consistently find its way here. The dollar, as I, as I like to say, is only in the third inning of a nine-inning game. We have got to get used to the fact that the dollar is going higher. Energy prices are going to remain low. Commodity prices are going to remain under pressure. Avoid it. Land, buy stocks. That's my story. I'm sticking with it. And as my old friend Paul Tudor Jones, whom I think is the best trader of all time, said, trading and investing is sort of like falling in love. You put your arms around that idea and you hold her tight. But if she shows you the first sign of disrespect, throw her overboard and disavow any association whatsoever. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking with it. Thank you. Well, Dennis, I think that what you've said about land could make a lot of people in this room very happy. So if you've got a farm, I want you to find a people's company person next to you. And I want you to lean over to him and say, sell my farm. <laughs> well, you've given us some interesting thought. We've got a couple of microphones popping up out here in the crowd. We'll see if we can take some questions. And are you already raising your hand, Susan? OK, you get the second question. I get the first one. China's economy. You know, we sell a lot to China. And we've counted on, Secretary Northey and I were there a couple of times, and their growth has been as high as 9% every year. But we're scared that China's economy is going to falter, and if so, it's going to have a backlash on us. What's going to happen? First of all, let's understand. The first time I went to China was 18 years ago. And when I went to China 18 years ago, and I stood on the, I was in Shanghai, and I stood on the, the banks of the Huangpo River, uh, that used to, Sh Shanghai, Shanghai was and still is the, the, the financial capital of China. And we're on the, the, the banks of the Wangpo, and the, the, the traffic light, they had a traffic light back then. The traffic light turned green, and I thought I was going to be run over by 10,000 bicycles when the traffic light turned green. You go to China now on Shanghai, one, you can't see across the Wangpo River because back then it was a rice paddy as far as the eye could see. And I remember a young man that I was standing there with said, in another 10 years, there will be five or 15 new skyscrapers over there where the new financial center of China is going to be located. He was such a liar. There's 100 skyscrapers over there now. It's unbelievable. And now when you stand on the same street in front of the Bund on the, looking at the Wangpo River and the light turns green, you're going to get run over by 10,000 automobiles instantaneously. It is astonishing. China's people have leaped from the 17th century into the 22nd century. They've bypassed the 20th and 21st. They've gone straight into the 22nd century. And the, 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 the simple fact of the matter is they're not going back. Now, everybody gets excited. I was, just, I was amused the other day when the, when the newspapers were talking about the fact that China's economy has slowed. GDP growth is 7%. We would die and go to heaven for 7% GDP growth. Europe is negative. The Chinese are in a recession when they, call it, when they have 7% GDP growth. The Chinese government has responded very aggressively in the past several months. 
to push reserves into the system. They understand that they might have overbuilt some housing in, in, in various provinces. But you have to remember this. When anybody tells you that China is going to slow, it is still a country where there are 700 million people living in the western provinces who in the biggest migration in the history of mankind are moving to the eastern provinces where China's leaped into the 21st and 22nd century. Those people are not going to go back. So I get amused at, at people worrying about China as if it is going into recession. Oh, maybe GDP growth falls to 6%. But that's probably about the worst that's going to happen. If China has a problem, it made one truly, truly stupid decision 30 years ago, which they have finally admitted and have, res and have ended. When China made the one, chi one, chi one child program and only allowed women to have one child, a family to have one child, the dumbest demographic decision in history if China can get past that, Chinese, uh, it's Chinese GDP growth 10 years from now will be 8, 9, 10, 11 percent. And the thing that we will be doing is exporting huge amounts of goods and services to them. Simply put, the Chinese have seen with the advent of the internet, until 10 or 15 years ago, if you were living in a, in a, in a village 50 miles to the west of Beijing, life in your village hadn't changed in 500 years. But in the last 15 years, life in your village has changed violently and the parents of China have seen what life looks like in Akron, Ohio. They've seen what life looks like in Paris. They've seen what life looks like in Bremen, Germany. And they are saying collectively to, the, to their Chinese leaders, we want that for our kids and you're going to get it for us. Come hell or high water. And that's what's going on. Don't let anybody tell you other than that. That's the circumstance. And they are, they are going to make that leap and they're going to be consistent buyers. Very soon, China will be not a net exporter of goods and services. They will be huge net importers of goods and services. It's just the nature of things. So I'm very bullish on China. Yeah, hi. Um, th that was excellent, uh, Dennis. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the focus on demographics because, as you heard before when I spoke, um, the flatlining in Japan is extreme. On the bottom of my chart, that was obvious yeah. as well. And Russia is another country where... Russia is another one, imploding. Yeah, imploding. I mean, really poor population, in fact, negative population growth. Yeah. Um, what I was going to say... And getting is, older by the hour. Yeah. And, and actually between 18 and 50... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, very good. I like that. <laughs> and, and one of the few known facts about Russia is the largest cause of death between 18 and 54 is um, vodka. I have alcoholism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's true. Um, well, I was going to make a couple of points. So the first is about Britain, um, just because I want to stand up for I want to I want to stand up for Britain here because I live there. Um, Britain does have positive growth, and so apart from Finland, Britain does have in Europe in a in a sea of 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 uh, basically left wing economies of Europe. Britain does have two to three percent growth. Um, also, housing in Britain is um, constantly under pressure. There's quite a tight uh, housing market. So one of the things I was going to mention is that in a on an island that is crowded. Uh, there's quite a strong underpinning generally for housing in the UK, unlike France and other countries in Europe. And people do look at their houses as their an pension plans. And even if the market pulls back from time to time, historically, uh, the British housing market has really been very stable. Um, and finally, I was going to raise, on behalf of Britain as well, the issue of fracking, because you're the second speaker today to raise it. And it is such a monumental, impactful um, issue for us globally. And it's one of the things that Britain might not have gotten right, because fracking is a very hot potato in the UK right, right now. Yeah. You probably have read about this. And it's in my area where I live in the countryside just outside of London. Um, and I was going to ask this question, which is, do you think that fracking is, under all circumstances, positive? Or is some of the negative press and negative publicity that I've read in the UK well, that, that, that accurate? Clearly, if you, if you sent out 10,000 wells to be drilled, fracked, you're going to have a problem with several of them. Not a question. To think otherwise would be illogical. You're going to obviously have some, some water that gets disturbed somewhere along the line. No question. But out of 10,000 wells, give me 9,998 of them that are, doing, that are producing energy and not creating problems, I think I'll take the 9,998. Thank you very much. Will there be problems? Of course there will be problems. Under all circumstances, is fracking pure and beautiful and wonderful? No, of course not. 
But on balance, do the, do the benefits outweigh, far outweigh any of the detriments? Absolutely. No question. What, what people don't understand about fracking and what they don't understand about how we drill nowadays, we always, when, when we see oil wells, we think that an oil well, we're sending a soda straw down into the ground and trying to hit some finite structure down in the ground. And 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, our hit rates uh, for, for drilling was, were about basically 50%. It was, a, it was a coin toss. Now with better technology, now with better methodologies of being able geographically, geologically to see down into the ground, our hit rates are about 95%. What's more important is now the soda straw goes down. And we used to think that that, that, that pool of energy was rather finite in shape. And you hope that you hit the top of it where the pressure would send up the oil dramatically in a gusher. That's what, that's what we see. That's our vision of oil. But really what we now understand is that those pockets of oil look like your fingers that extend for miles out in various directions. In the old days, you couldn't have possibly drilled to hit those fingers. Now we send one soda straw down, and we know what those fingers look like, and we bend the soda straw. And we can send 10, 15, 20 wells off of that one. So under his, I bet there's just one well somewhere within a mile or two miles of his house, and I bet there's hundreds of wells coming off there to which, are being, to which money is being paid. It's, it's, it's that horizontal drilling plus, plus fracking has changed the United States dramatically. God, it's, it's, bless it's, God bless Halliburton. Yeah. You know, just so everybody doesn't slit their wrist here and talk about uh, $2 corn, you know, if we have $2 corn and natural gas that's $2, you know, those are the two lowest input costs for ethanol. So that puts the cost of ethanol down to about 60, 70 cents a gallon to produce. So you, don't, you think ethanol is going away and can't compete with oil at that price? I, I think that the American public doesn't understand ethanol. I, I, I think the American public doesn't understand ethanol. If it does understand ethanol, it understands it tends to be a corrosive uh, fuel. And I think that the ability in, in, in the present environment to continue any subsidy programs for ethanol are, are mooted and gone. But I'm open for discussions on that. For, first of all, I will argue that, I will argue the point vehemently that it was derivatives that caused the collapse in 2005, 6, 7, and 8. I will say instead, it was the housing market that caused the decline in, in, in the economy in 2006, 7, and 8. It was the government that sponsored forced, asked, moved to have people allowed to buy mortgages, to buy houses that should not have been allowed to buy a house, putting down no money down, having no money in the game. And when prices fell by the first 5%, the margin calls, for lack of a better term, that went out to the public on houses that they should never have been allowed to buy collapsed like dominoes. I, I argue that it was not the derivatives market that caused the collapse. It was the government itself that allowed too many people to buy too many houses with no money down and no skin in the game. Once that market cleared itself, the economy turned around. I, 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 I will argue vehemently that it was the derivatives market that caused the collapse. Uh, I will argue, in fact, that the derivatives market gives you a place to hedge risks, that there's no question that there were some people who took speculative positions and, and made large sums of money. No question about that. God bless them. Well thought out. Well done. There were no question there were people who lost large sums of money taking the other side. Uh, but I will vehemently argue that it was the derivatives market. It is, that was such a small percentage of what was involved compared to the ultimate amount of mortgages that had been purchased on houses that should never have been sold in the first place. When you had every Yahoo waiter in the world who bought a house, watched it go up in value by 10%, took that, used that as equity, bought two more houses, hoped it went up 10%, took that, bought six more houses, and when the first 10% correction came along, wiped him out, that was the problem. And that happened time and time and time again. If you want to call speculation in housing in that manner a derivative, then perhaps derivatives were the problem. If you want to call it just speculation on the part of people who shouldn't have been speculating, I'll call it that. Dennis, one last thing. How can people get your newsletter? Um, it, it's, you, you, I'm, I'm on the web. I don't go out of my way to try to sell it. So uh, you, can, you can find, just Google my name and you'll find it and we'll send it to you for a couple of weeks. But it's bloody expensive and um, we keep it that way.
How's that for salesmanship? Dennis Garthman, thank you very much. We appreciate you being our speaker.